Welcome to the Amazon Legends Podcast, where we have real stories about making it big on Amazon. Our guests are CEOs of large companies and entrepreneurs who became powerful sellers, also experts specializing in helping sellers, and both former and current Amazon employees who will give us an insight from behind the scenes. Here's your host, Nick Urison. Welcome to another episode of Amazon Legends. My next guest today is uh, someone who built an Amazon operation from startup and achieved $10 million in annual run rate in 90 days. I mean, I've been in Amazon space for 20 years. I've never seen anybody do $10 million run rate in 90 days. So uh, clearly he knows what how to do things. He's passionate about all forms of advertising, which may explain why he, he achieved that kind of revenue so quickly. He is currently the marketing director at Akiko, which is an Amazon aggregator. And when he's not working, he's a serious travel enthusiast uh, to the extent that he traveled to all 50 states and five continents. So I was going to say, you know, I wonder which one he hasn't been. <laughs> uh, there isn't anything. So with that, everybody, meet my guest, John Bergen. Welcome to the show, John. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me, Nick. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I'm dying to, I'm dying to hear why you are so hung up on advertising, and it goes way back to your childhood. So you're going to tell us all about it a little bit later. But uh, I want to ask you, so since you are an advertising pro and advertising veteran, and you are overseeing and Akiko, all things about obviously advertising. Um, give us the, the best advertising strategy to make Amazon listing successful. Definitely. Well, it takes, uh, to, to give you a short and sweet answer, it takes a little inspiration and then a little bit of perspiration. Okay, the perspiration part we're going to get into and dissect it, but give us the inspiration. What is the inspiration? Uh, on the advertising approach yeah so i i think you know you, you need to be creative with with how you approach everything but at the same time kind of follow a lot of the best practices and uh you know blend the creative component with uh with your with those best practices so uh a lot of the times i see competitors who uh you know they they kind of do one or the other. <laughs> they go with the super creative thing that doesn't really fit in the right, you know, format, uh, or they they rigidly follow the the best practice guideline and it's super generic and doesn't get any attention. So, uh, so I think kind of balancing that out. And we can go into detail about that. Uh, it, you know, is, is a really key component to to what we do at Aquico and and what I've done my whole career. So as far as the best practices you mentioned, let's go through the best practices first. So um, which, what is the, the most important? And then let's work your way through. Yeah, so with Amazon, uh, as most people know, the advertising platform is, in, in terms of visuals, is, is pretty basic in terms of like what you can do. Uh, it's getting a lot more complicated now with video, custom display images, lifestyle images, that kind of thing. But for the bulk of what most people are going to be doing, it's using uh, sponsored product ads, which just take your product image, uh, or you know, even sponsored display that uses your product image, or uh, sponsored brand where you have your logo, and then product images. Uh, lifestyle images and, and stuff is new now. And you know that that offers a lot more creativity, uh, but you know mo almost all of the spend, uh, you know that that and, and eyeballs that are going to see your ads are, you know, most of it's going through those core channels, uh, and so product image is a is a huge one that uh, you know we we really focus on to make sure that that looks great because not only does the customer see it on the product page, but they're going to see it in every single ad. So this is about the sponsored products, right? Yep, sponsored products, sponsored display, sponsored brands. Those all can pull in the product uh, product image into that 
a kind of pre-made template that Amazon uses. Yeah, so you are saying that use the product pictures in those sponsored ones in, in your ad advertising because that's what's going to get the most click-throughs, right? Correct, yeah, that, that, that's what people are seeing. So you want to make sure that not only is it great on your product page, but think about it as not just a product page image, but also what everyone's going to see in your ads. Okay. Okay, so... Yeah, I mean, when, you know, this is actually, you, you, you said it yourself, when they land on the product page after clicking on it, that plays a big role in conversion, which is what you want, right, in the end. Yeah, yeah definitely. So share with us some best practices in how that product picture, the main, what they call the hero image, right? So what that hero image should look like. Yeah, so there, there are a few things uh, that I've seen work pretty well. I've seen uh, items that have kind of related images or, or related uh, components to the product itself. Uh, so, it, it, you know, if you're selling a stand mixer to also have, you know, like uh, the ingredients that you would put into it featured in the image as well, or uh, if you, you know, have a, a coffee mug, you might want to put coffee beans or, you know, something related. Uh, it, it can kind of catch your attention instead of just a product only, like, in your face that that's it on a white background, you know, just super simple. Uh, you know, ha incorporating a little bit more can make your product stand out while still having, you know, your product featured. Uh, another one is uh, with colors. So, a lot of people just pick the one color for their main product image. Uh, if you can showcase, you know, more colors that, you know, compared to your competitor is only showing maybe a black version of something, you show ten colors that that changes things. Now you you have a you know a, some, something that differentiates yourself from your competitors. Even though if you click on the competitor listing, they might have ten colors on their their listing. Being able to showcase that uh, helps a lot. Yeah. You know? And how do you show 10 colors in one product picture? Like put a swatch inside it or? Yeah, there, there are a few different ways you can kind of stack them up against each other. Uh, you can oh, have, a, yeah, have a color wheel or, or something like that to show that there's, there's more available. Okay. So there, there are a couple of creative ways of going about it, um, but, okay. but that can help in, in, in those cases. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I see that. I see a lot of that with the iPhone cases mm -hmm. and things like that. So they like they, like a deck of cards. They open it up. And, yep. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So I want to share with you something and, and see what your take on it uh, is. Yeah. I like to put this to test. Um, it's called image theme. Are you familiar with what that is? I image theme? Yeah. No, I'm not, not familiar. So what happens is when I take on a client uh, at the beginning, obviously we spend a lot of time on pictures. And the first thing we do is we storyboard the pictures. So what will this, the, the pictures uh, will tell? What story will it tell? So you have the, the features and then you have the infographic and then you have the lifestyle or use case, whichever. So we, we build all that and, and then create in writing, forget about pictures, what we want in those pictures. However, that those are those come next after we deal with the image theme. And what image theme is, is we I recommend that every seller must have a theme running throughout all the pictures that will communicate number one a message about the product and also it will govern the whole story with the pictures that the buyers, Amazon shoppers will identify with the seller mm -hmm. as something. Oh, this is, it's a, it, it's an identity thing. It's a branding thing. So a typical image theme, for example, you, you mentioned, Put the beans, the coffee beans around the mug. So if you're selling coffee products, you could create an image theme that has 
some coffee beans, and then uh, some leaves, you know, just to add color. One version of that could be in the bottom right corner of the main picture. And then different versions of like take use case, you could like sprinkle coffee beans around the top of the, the main picture. And then, you know, uh, on the side, those leaves also. So that same image theme carries throughout all the pictures and governs the pictures. Um, that's what I mean by image theme. Mm -hmm. So what is your take on it? it definitely, yeah. We, we, we like to focus on like brand level, uh, you know, because we have multiple products within a brand. So a brand level kind of overarching, uh, you could say brand guideline or, or style uh, that we follow for all the products within it. Uh, and I, I would say we have pretty consistent branding throughout, uh, which is really important. Uh, and then you're right, like as you as you go through the process, you know, you kind of need something at the beginning to catch the person, the consumer's attention. Uh, and then from there, you can kind of open up, you know, car carry out that theme throughout, like you mentioned, but also open things up more and more. So you start with, you know, hey, we have this product with uh, multiple colors. And then once you get to the page, it's, you know, maybe in the A plus content, you feature all the ways that you can use this product. It's, it's not just a, a mug or a stand mixer, you know, you can, with a stand mixer, you can make X, Y, and Z product uh, or you know uh, a recipe and it's not just for mixing things you know it's you could use it for grinding meat or you know other things like that so uh to be able to kind of take the customer through a journey where there's that consistent look and feel uh, it makes it really natural for the customer to feel comfortable as they go through it uh and then it's kind of cool to like you said like sprinkle things in so you know you're, you're you have this mental note of what you're right. going to use it for. And then maybe you see at the bottom there, like all these recipes are, are in the, you know, images like three, four, five, and six, you have, you know, different use cases for this tool. Uh, I think that is great because most people aren't thinking like that, but when they see it, they're like, oh, there's so much more value added to this product uh, than what I was even intending. So, you know, if it's $20 and they were on the fence about it, now it's like, you know, really cheap yeah. because I have so many ideas of what I can do with it. Yeah. So, you know, so. you added a whole new dimension to the idea. Uh, I didn't really think that far. You know what my main focus was in this image theme mm -hmm. uh, idea? It was to increase the click-through rate. So because uh, if you have this image theme in, the, in your main product picture, that's going to show up in the search results. So now imagine you searched something and a bunch of products come up, right? So you have 20 organic on that page. The idea is to get the people who are interested in it to click. You are up against 20 others plus the sponsored. So when you see picture after picture after picture of products side by side, and then suddenly you your picture has this theme it makes it stand out mm -hmm. so more people end up clicking on it because it looks it looks first of all it looks 3d mm -hmm. that's the way you know you the, the, the designer should design it uh, and and also it totally differentiates you there's mm -hmm. something else in it so it increases the click-through rate that was my main incentive yep uh, but when you carry the whole image theme throughout the pictures and then continue on the A plus, now it's a whole different story. So uh, it's a big deal. Yep, yeah. And then one, one quick trick that I've seen, if you, you know, if you have a lean team or you don't have the time to build out cr really creative imagery, I I've seen, uh, at least in terms of the ad, ad standpoint, a lot of people will go, you know, oh, the, the blue version is the best seller. So that's the one we're gonna advertise and we'll leave off the rest. And what I've seen is put all the colors in your ad campaign, run them all at once and see which one has the best click through rate. Because a lot of the time, you know, that maybe the red one is more eye catching uh, compared to your competitors who are all doing the blue. 
someone goes, well, that's cool and different. And then they click on it and then maybe they go like, eh, well, you know, maybe the blue would look better <laughs> in my kitchen, but, but like, you know, look at the data and see which one has the better click through rate, which one's actually driving, not necessarily the end sale, but which one's driving those clicks. Uh, and you'll often be surprised. I mean, sometimes the best seller is the best looking, but sometimes it's not. Uh, oh. And, and uh, so, you know, you can use the data to be able to do it that way too. And that, that, that's if you don't want to do, you know, get too, too in depth. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, nothing is static, right? So, I mean, today it may, the data may show this is it. Uh, or you may, in fact, have a gut call, which happens to be accurate. But that doesn't mean that's going to stick throughout. Mm -hmm. uh, things yep. change. You know, seasons change. Based on the seasons, people, I mean, we gravitate more towards white or lighter colors in the summer. Why? Because it's too hot. I can't stand to see a dark color in the, <laughs> in the heat. It makes me already too hot and it's already warm enough. So uh, it's nothing is static. You can't be making those calls. Yep. All right. Yeah. So we covered the first best practice where you use the product picture and make sure that... Uh, you are not just limiting yourself and use image theme if possible and then carry that throughout the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, so next one. So let's share the next best practice. Uh, yeah, so this one requires more resources, but it, it's to really take on, you know, every type of campaign type within Amazon uh, and hopefully beyond that, it, you know, if you have the bandwidth to go off Amazon. But even with, within Amazon's advertising ecosystem, there's so much that so many sellers don't do to the full extent. Uh, and they're leaving a lot of, you know, cheap, cheap revenue on the table uh, because, you know, it's like, oh, I, I you know, I, I don't want to have 30 campaigns for each product. Well, there are 30 different strategies you can use, oh, over 30 different strategies you can use uh, for a product on Amazon ads. So, to limit yourself that way uh, really, you know, hold, holds yourself back. And a lot of the time those, you know, whether it's like sponsor brand or sponsor brand video or sponsor display, DSP, you know, a lot of the time those are uh, even cheaper CPCs. You can reach your target audience, uh, you know, for, for a lower cost. The conversion rates can be extremely high, uh, but, you know, maybe it takes making a video. And if you have a lean team, and not a ton of resources, it's tough to swallow the pill to invest in a good quality video, uh, but you know, it can make a huge difference. And another thing is like, once you get those programs started, it, it's not set it and forget it because you, know, you have to continue to optimize, but you know, if, you, if you try six different things and three of them work, like you've just got you know, a, a ton more revenue uh, at a lower than average cost. Uh, going forward and you know it, it just all it requires is is a little bit more effort yeah you know? okay so the 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 lesson here is try to run as many campaigns as possible for different variations with focus on different key phrases um, because if some of them don't work but some do you are still better off than it, where you started right de definitely and all of that testing period will pay for itself in the long run uh, and you can cut your losses pretty quickly but it's not not just create as many campaign types as possible uh, but you know have, have a strategy or reason behind every campaign type so maybe for this one we're going after competitor asins maybe for this one we're going after competitor keywords or their brand names maybe for another we're going after generic terms uh, at, at, you know, maybe different levels like phrase or broad or, you know, all, all of the, at the different match type levels. So there, there are all these different combinations of campaigns you can make. Uh, it, get, it can get complicated, but if you can uncover even a few that work really efficiently, it, it normally covers the cost of any other tests you do. So I want to share with you something that I, I haven't actually tested with a, with a customer yet, but I thought about this. So you use Helium 10, right? You're familiar mm -hmm. with Helium. 
Yep. So helium 10 uh, has this new pre-configured filters that they call pop keywords and opportunity keywords, right? And opportunity keywords are those where only a, only a small number of the competing ASINs are actually dominating. But I see another opportunity, and that is if you target your com competitive ASINs, whoever you are competing with, get a list of their organic keywords that mean something to you that are also realistic, like not with 200,000 search volumes. <laughs> so you get a list of all the organics. And then you get a list of all the sponsored. And then compare. Well, guess what you're going to find? Some of those organics are not being sponsored. Now, that's a real opportunity for you to go run a campaign on those because you won't be competing with these big boys. And then you can very quickly dominate them, right? Yep, definitely. Yeah, we have uh, keyword trackers that... Uh, you know, we use a couple different services as well as internal tools to just keep track every week of what's going on with competitors. What are they bidding on? What are they, uh, you know, what do they have, you know, or where are they ranking organically? And how can we you know, get an edge there? Uh, and, you know, over time, like everyone starts to copy each other and you end up with the same, same group, but we're far from that time. So... <laughs> So yeah, there's well, definitely a, constant, a lot of opportunity. It, it's a it's a constant changing game. Obviously, yep. there's no, okay. So I have a question while we are on the campaign strategy subject. Which one do you go for? Short tail with high volume, naturally higher bid, versus long tail, and therefore lower bid, but many of them. Which one is a better strategy? I, I think it really depends on the product. So we have some products where two or three terms cover 50% of revenue for that category. And so you're really incentivized to go after that, that word because it's, it's what everyone's looking for. Uh, and people don't really search you know, in new ways that often for it. Uh, so for for that, I would do more of a, you know, focus on the the core term as well as more awareness efforts on the side, uh, where you can, you know, drum up essentially new business uh, and get people who are interested. Going after the long tail there, you know, you're going after a pretty small pool of people. Uh, but then there are other uh, there are other products where people, you know, the the way people search is so broad. And and how they end up on your your item uh, item is you know a, a much longer journey or it's uh, just m you know more unique and so for that I you know would would take a more long tail approach so I think you can do a couple things you can use Helium Ten to see what are the top keywords and how much volume there is and if that's really spread out across a lot of a lot of terms then maybe take the more long tail approach um, sometimes you'll see you know, 90% of the search volume is within the one term, maybe go a different direction. Yeah. So the other thing uh, that came up in one of the episodes, in fact, we titled the episode uh, Making Money While Losing Money, M Making Money By Losing Money. Uh, and that's bidding on these popular search terms higher bid nevertheless you're going to make a loss there's no question but that loss benefits you in the long run because you rank up you mm -hmm. improve your bsr and when you improve your bsr you have higher visibility and also you're getting more volume which will translate into more orders which will add more re reviews for you so um, it's a i mean of course you need to be prepared to burn through a budget for that kind of stuff. You mm -hmm. can't do it permanently, but uh, it's a strategy. So 
uh, as long as it's for testing, it's for short term, for specific purposes, uh, I guess this is unavoidable. You have to do it because if you really cut down the, uh, if, if you really want to push your overall ROI on your advertising efforts, you're going to cut down the volume. You may yep. get very good conversion, very good, uh, you know, ratio on how much you spend versus what your total sales are. Uh, but it's going to be very small in the end. So, yeah. And uh, over the last two years, I think that strategy, uh, it probably worked really well a, a year ago. And then everyone caught on to it. And then you get in this crazy bidding war where, you know, it's, right. it's, it's for short term, but, you know, I, I bid really aggressively this week i get bsr one then i you know i have to pull back because it's not sustainable and then yeah. the next you know your 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 top competitor does it the following week and you, you just kind of go back and forth and in the end you both wasted a lot of money so i i think you know that it, it worked really well probably a year ago and then over the last year there's just been this crazy bidding war going on in the future, I don't know how sustainable it will be. I think there there's still going to be, uh, you know, that 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 strategy of if you lose your rank, you can basically pay to push it back up. Uh, that'll continue, but but I like long term, I don't know if you know if if it's that sustainable to do it. Uh, you know, if, if everyone's doing it, uh, just because the, there's always going to be someone with that you know during that week that wants to do it and it's just going to drive cpcs up really high so uh and we, yeah. we've started to see you know a, a little bit of cooling i guess you could say uh with with some of those top terms they're they're coming down a little bit uh you know i, I think it, it's because like the you know lose money to make money approach uh, you know is it's a short-term thing <laughs> so so as, as companies go on and you keep playing that game again and again uh, you know if you only have to play it once it's great but if you have to play it all the time <laughs> then it can get pretty oh, brutal no. yeah <laughs> yeah i mean everything has to be things like that i mean you testing right so test doesn't last forever at some point you have to decide what test showed and if you're not getting the result that's also a result right mm -hmm. so it's uh you have to be careful so um okay so the first one was product pictures in your advertising make sure you're using don't limit yourself and the second one is expand your campaigns run multiple campaigns it's a little bit of work but it pays off even if half of them don't pay off, the, the other half that will be better than what you have in the first place. Uh, let's move on to another one. Yeah, so then you kind of go into like off Amazon uh, opportunities. So that, that one, and I, I do it all in this order, you know, if you don't have a good listing image and good listing content, you're advertising to something that's probably not going to work. So you're you're limiting yourself there once once you have that then you know you do everything you possibly can on amazon which is the lowest funnel high and you know there's no, no more high intent purchase to purchase place uh, on the internet so so you, you, you kind of max that out next and then once you've maxed that out then you go off amazon and you can do that in a lot of ways you can uh you know you can run google and facebook TikTok, instagram like all these social uh, or other search, uh, uh, you know, channels pointing to Amazon. You can go you know, Shopify route, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, create a D2C site and push traffic that way. Uh, and then you can also go to other marketplaces, which is a pretty popular option, takes a ton of time, uh, but, uh, but, you know, can be extremely lucrative. So going to Walmart, Target, those, those types of places, uh, you know, Kind of expand your your horizon of of or your limit of of how far you can push that product. So you you're talking about selling on a Shopify site or on other marketplaces, not advertising. Uh, well, so a good a good thing to do when you get to those places is to advertise. I mean, it's similar to Amazon. 
maybe five years ago where if you're the first in your category on a, a new marketplace, you have a huge first mover advantage. So if you can gain sales velocity quickly, uh, you know, the, the bids are often a, a more reasonably priced uh, there since in, in some cases you might not have any competition uh, or very little competition. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like Amazon 10 years ago, if you had the best seller then, there are a lot of them that might not today, but there are a lot that still do in their category because, you know, they yeah. just have that velocity, the reviews, the the name, like the brand, everything, so the and repeat customers. So, uh, so there, there's huge first mover advantage there, but it, it's each one of those is harder and harder. You know, each one of the uh, uh, channels is harder and harder, and kind of that third step of going off Amazon. Uh, be, becomes more challenging. Yeah. So uh, off Amazon, it's multiple pieces. So you you just mentioned quite a few. So let's dig into each one separately. First of all, Shopify. Shopify means you're doing your own fulfillment and you're driving the customer to your Shopify site. Correct. So, yeah. But in order to drive the customer to your Shopify site, you have to advertise so that's Google, Facebook, or any any Instagram or anything else like that. So Correct. it does not involve the marketplaces. Correct. So Correct. You, you simply, so this really is not an advertising strategy, so to speak, yet uh, as, as Shopify, it's a channel strategy. So you're mm -hmm. suggesting once you exhaust all the possibilities by using the uh, on-site advertising on Amazon, create another channel and sell through Shopify. So that's one. How you drive traffic to your Shopify site, we're not having that discussion right now because it will, it's a whole different world. Yep. However, what I will say for anybody listening um, in this context is it's so important to have your Shopify site. I always recommend, especially at the beginning, uh, absolutely create the listings on your site and link it back to your Amazon listing to complete the purchase there. That gives you two things. First of all, if you don't yet have the infrastructure to manage inventory in multiple locations and you're using FBA, you don't have to worry about anything. Just focus on replenishing your FBA inventory. You'll be fine because it's servicing both your Shopify site and Amazon operation. The second benefit is by driving people to your site, they are getting on your mailing list. They are not Amazon customer, they are your customers. So you can use your mailing list to drive business at any point in time on demand to your listings on Amazon or any other marketplace, right? So um, do, do you like that idea? Do you support that approach? Yeah, definitely. And you, you can, you know, it's an easier way to expand to a, a Shopify or, you know, any of those platforms or, or even other marketplaces. You can use all the hard work that you, you know, everything you did on Amazon, you know, those listing images, maybe the sizing or, you know, the format needs to be a little bit different, but, you know, you're just editing your creative and, and your content accordingly. Uh, but you've also, you've also done a lot of the legwork ahead of time. So, uh, yeah. so th that, that helps with that barrier to entry is that, you know, you've already done the work. Uh, you just need to edit it and fine tune it to, to get there. Yeah. So, uh, the other thing you mentioned is other marketplaces. So there you have the situation where again, it's a different channel. It's not Shopify, but it's a different channel. So that means creating the listing, just like Amazon. It's another Amazon operation, but you'll be much earlier than others. At what point should a business take on something like this? I think once you feel like you've maxed out what you can do on Amazon, uh, obviously Amazon's rolling out new new features. And, you know, in, in terms of advertising, there's been like five to 10 new big projects this year alone. Uh, so, so that, you know, the, the opportunity there continues to expand. Uh, but when you feel like you're doing that really well and you're not, and you're, you know, maybe not seeing 
the, the same growth that you saw originally, then you know going to some of those other platforms can yield you you know five, 10, 15 percent more than what you're getting. Uh, but I, I you know and then there's, there's also like the first mover advantage too. So while it might be a lot of extra work today and you know maybe not the best business move if you think that there's still a little bit of opportunity on Amazon, if you can just start somewhere else, uh, now you, you have a, a long-term advantage once you've figured out everything on Amazon. So I think there's a bit of a balance, but if you haven't started, you know, if you, if you don't feel like you're halfway on Amazon <laughs> or doing half of what you could be doing, then, you know, maybe not, it's just going to be another headache for you. So, uh, so knowing, yeah. knowing what you, uh, what your potential is yep. and how far you have come with that potential. I tell you what, you never know the answer to that. And yeah, so I yeah. tell you, I tell you that this is a funny uh, story. I mean, at the time it wasn't funny when it happened, but we got shut down when I first started as an Amazon seller. Uh, we, it was a terrible time. And this is for anybody who wants to listen episode 101. That's my story and why actually I started this podcast. Uh, so long story short we got shut down and we took a, a very principled approach and we told at the time they assigned a category manager to us and said what is going on because our negatives went to 35 percent so uh, we said we were in between migration shopping season started just we just we ran a promotion without thinking through the consequences. And we got a thousand orders on an item that had only 45 pieces in stock. So we canceled the rest and it was a big deal. And mm -hmm. we got flamed and, and shut down six weeks. It took us six weeks to be reinstated. And every week they checked our numbers if they were moving in the right direction with the negatives. Because once you shut down, there's no more new order coming in. <laughs> you have to deal with the negatives, get the customers to remove them. So anyway, then everything was fine. A year later, still we are having weekly reviews. Our order count, daily order count had reached 300. This is within the first year. Mm -hmm. And the category manager said, you know, I don't need to be wasting my time with you guys anymore. You know what you're doing. We're very happy with what you've done, uh, blah, blah, blah. So at that point, we asked, what is the potential? How far can we go? Because you know the numbers and, and we're doing, obviously we were doing nothing was the beginning. And then within a year now, consistently 300 orders a day. And she said, we would never imagine that you would come even this far and you've done pretty well and we cannot share numbers with you, but just take it from us that you've done pretty well. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, two that, years I mean... <laughs> later, we were doing 2000 a day. You never know, right? Yeah, you never, you never know. know. And the, the, maybe the market got bigger too. You know, people, the, yeah, if, the, if yeah. demand went up, then maybe you're, yeah. you're, you're getting a, the same slice, but a bigger pie, right? So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, the bottom line, you never know. You never yeah. know for all kinds of reasons. Everything yeah. is changing. Amazon is not telling you anything. So, um, I guess it's a, it becomes a judgment call at some point. You say, but in principle, you want to diversify your sales. And, uh, you know, you are an aggregator, right? Mm -hmm. So you want diversity when you are acquiring a brand. You want diversity in channels, diversity in skew pool. Uh, yeah, so diversity yeah. in traffic. Those are the things that give higher valuation. Yeah, so and, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you're growing your business, you know, you'll like, hopefully things are up and to the right. But, you, you know, it's not always a straight line. You, you have kind of flat periods and then a breakthrough moment where you find something that really works and then you know another you know flat period and then another breakthrough i think maybe once you've 
a good way to tell would be if you're not really finding any new breakthrough moments, uh, then, you know, then maybe it's time to expand. Another thing to think about is to use the data that's available. So you can use like Amazon brand analytics. You can now see your purchase share uh, compared to your competitors. So if you're in a category and you've got 5% of the category, there's still 95% more to go. So, uh, so you know, then that kind of tells you that there's a lot of opportunity for you. Uh, whereas if you have 40% market share, uh, of of purchases for those top keywords, then you know maybe maybe this is a good time to switch. So I think you can either use the use the data that is available from Amazon, or you know you, you, at the end it's kind of your gut feel. But but if you're struggling to expand, uh, you know then and you, you know you're you're doing everything you can, then uh, potentially it's a, a good time to to jump as well. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I always like data driven decision making. Yeah. So that's yep. the best way. You will there will be a time for you to have the gut call, but have the gut call based on data. Of course, because data will not t make decisions for you. It will help you make decisions, and so, so, John, I have a question for you, which I'm sure a lot of the listeners want to know the answer to again this is not a one size fits all scenario when you drive external traffic to amazon you are advertising on facebook instagram google you name it your advertise your advertising is not necessarily seen exclusively by shoppers it's anybody right mm -hmm. so they click on it they land on your product page directly. So now you've driven more traffic to your product page, a good percentage of which are not buyers. So your conversion rate dies, takes a nosedive, depending on how much you're doing. And then your ranking suffers. So you may get some extra sales, but at what price? So the question is, stick to on-site advertising on Amazon only because you know only buyers will come to your site versus drive external traffic knowing that some of those will not be buyers and your conversion rate will suffer, which will lead to losing rank. Which one? Yeah, so... We haven't really seen the the ranking decline issue as much, uh, and we've talked with people at Amazon who say that it shouldn't negatively impact you as much, and there's an expectation that conversion rate will be low or lower than on Amazon. Uh, so, so we haven't seen it negatively impact us as much, but uh, but that might be because they are converting maybe with a competitor. They're buying something else, you know, so Amazon's fine with it. Uh, and so maybe that traffic is good for them and just not good for us in, the, in that scenario. Right. Uh, but, I, we, you know, we, we've had a lot of success uh, going off Amazon. Uh, and Amazon has a program called uh, the Brand Referral Bonus Program. Uh, right. So you can get 10% back for driving that traffic. And the part that I like, I mean, I obviously like getting 10% of sales back as, as a, a referral bonus. Uh, that, that helps a lot. But uh, the best part is using Amazon attribution to be able to see you know, what, what sales you're getting. And, uh, you know, is this worth it or not? Because there's no, there aren't uh, connections right now between, you know, Google and Amazon. Uh, there's a company doing it, but you know, it, it, there's not like an easy connection between the two of them uh, or Facebook and Amazon. And so to be able to match up what you're doing on an ad, ad perspective as well as a return perspective is has been really nice. In terms of ranking, we haven't it, we haven't seen any off Amazon things negatively impacting ranking. Uh, and when we've had really good performance, we have seen a nice boost in rank. Uh, but for for ranking, we, we normally focus on like 
on Amazon keyword boosting and things like that. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm hearing is definitely, first of all, register for the brand referral bonus program. That means that you've driven $10,000 worth of sales from Facebook ads direct to your listing and generated $10,000 in sales. You get up to 10% of that back. Sure. Correct. Credited yeah. to your, so it's a huge deal. Amazon is all, is paying you to bring external traffic because it's more potential buyers for them. Yeah, right? uh, yeah, they, they'd love to have you pay to bring them customers. And uh, they, they, I mean, on Google, I, I'm pretty sure they're still the number one advertiser on Google. Uh, so to be able to have all of the third party sellers on Amazon paying their ad bill is. Uh, <laughs> is is pretty attractive to them so to pay 10 percent, I, I you know I, I think it's it's a win-win for everyone uh, yeah. so. you definitely recommend doing that uh, knowing that your conversion rate will will take a little bit of a dip C correct now if your targeting is really good on those platforms uh and you've got a great message and you have great creative you know, you should be able to sell uh, sell your product uh, to to those new customers. Uh, you know, if you do a nice job with it, uh, and then you can also do things like I, I've seen a lot of strategies with the the creative trying to basically uh, eliminate people. Uh, so people who you know won't work, like on Google, if you're let, let's say you're, uh, you know. A, pair of headphones or something like that and you you sell a white white pair of headphones you know you you want to have that in the title like white headphones because <laughs> if someone's interested in a blue pair you don't want them clicking on your ad because you don't sell that oh i see uh, what you mean and, and, and if they're in-ear headphones you want to write white in-ear headphones because you don't want someone who wants you know over the ear headphones so that there are all sorts of tricks there to basically eliminate those clicks which saves you money but it also you know make sure that the people who are clicking are uh you know pretty interested in exactly what you're offering versus uh just you know saying we sell headphones right so uh so i have seen a lot of uh, interesting tricks there to improve conversion rate and we've, we've implemented some which maybe that's why uh, you know the conversion rate issue hasn't negatively impacted rank uh but uh but it, it's definitely pretty it's pretty interesting uh, on amazon you know you, you're happy to go after headphones and white headphones <laughs> and all those yeah. are good keywords so uh so yeah it's, it's just a little different when you're going off amazon yeah yeah i mean definitely this is this is so true eliminate you know, I, I always say there are two ways to find the right answer to a question. One is, you know, the answer, and then you know, that's the answer. The other is eliminate the wrong ones, right? Right, so, right. In your case, <laughs> you say eliminate the potential buyers uh, expecting just Somebody anything. Yeah. Just be. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what I'm hearing is uh, don't be afraid to use external traffic for the conversion. Just make sure that you're advertising. Uh, message and the creatives that you use in that external advertising is specific enough to only attract potential interested genuine buyers to click on the ad yep definitely. Uh, and then use amazon attribution to track how the camp campaigns are doing yep yep that's... and then track the overall conversion rate also you know just tracking the campaign not enough track the overall conversion rate on the page so that way you have an idea and then you can associate the 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 ebbs and flows based on the events that you're tracking okay yep. yeah all right that's very valuable well i'm sure you and i can go on forever about the, this strategy that strategy and give this example give that example but uh we don't have time uh, so I want to learn a little bit about you because you mentioned, uh, or I should say, I mentioned based on our conversation when we first met that you've always been interested in advertising. So, um, so I want to learn about you and then where that came from. But first tell us, uh, where did you grow up? Let's take us way back and then let's understand your life experiences a little bit. 
Yeah, yeah. I grew up uh, downtown Chicago. Uh, um, and my, my family still lives there. Uh, we're, I'm currently down in Florida, but uh, enjoying the warm weather and getting away from cold. The cold winters up there had had enough of that. But, uh, but yeah, I grew up in Chicago, went to school in Florida and back to Chicago for work uh, and, and got a job at an ad agency uh, there. And and that, that was like dream come true, you know, because I uh, when I was in uh, high school, even even junior high school, uh, I was you know really passionate about learning, uh, like learning advertising and really understanding like why people, uh, you know, act, act the way they do purchase, you know, understand their purchase behavior. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, I, I, even as a young kid, I was uh, taking like I, I took a uh, independent study with uh, one of the pr uh, professors at the uh, high school who said, uh, you know, he, he was in, into psychology and, and uh, gave me some psychology textbooks. Then I thought I was going to be a psychology major and that would be my in, in uh, into advertising uh, and just learning things like, you know, the, the colors of logos, like why do all the fast food places have yellow and red? And that's because like in your your brain it, it you know gets you thinking about food and like yellow is like you know unhealthy and red is food and <laughs> unhealthy food feels good <laughs> so so there's a reason why uh wendy's mcdonald's burger king you know all of them have it and as a kid like that was so fascinating to me uh and, and you know why why is, uh, is like subway why do they use green like green's healthy so just like that that was like the the coolest thing as a as a kid is like oh how can you use colors to make people think differently uh and uh so so i got really into that and then in college i took some psychology classes and uh, you know realized like you know no like the media stuff is more uh, in line with, with what i want to do and uh, you know, I was able to learn a lot more about consumer behavior specific to advertising that way, uh, instead of learning about how the brain works and all, all of that. So, uh, so you know. as a kid, it's because it all goes back to, you know, when you were a kid, you became interested. So when was the first time you realized that interest of what affects people to make that those decisions? Uh, well, so I, I grew up downtown, uh, which is different. I, I think most most kids don't do that. Uh, and in downtown Chicago, you know, you, you walk down the magnificent mile. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, uh, you know, you see like all the stores. There's water tower place. You can, you know, as a kid, we I used to like, my parents would take me to the 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 mall there, which is this building, you know, like a, a residential building, and then underneath they have. A, big mall uh and you know we'd go go there i'd be jumping up and down on the macy's beds and you know it was just like a, a thing to do in the winter when it was too cold so uh you know we, we'd kind of wander around the city and uh you know you can see you know, one of the big things like uh, marshall field uh, which is now macy's there you, it's really nice to walk in the winter you see all the displays in the windows of you know different art or different uh you know, little railroads and things like that. And like, how do you, you know, and like, I, I know they're trying to sell a product, but they're, they're also creating an experience. So, so that was always kind of fun, like as a, as a kid to go explore and see all these stores uh, and have it all right there and not need to go anywhere. It was, it was pretty unique. So, uh, and then in the city, you know, you, you can't avoid advertising. So, you know, I know in some States they don't have advertising uh, like billboards and stuff. So it can be pretty, peaceful and i, I really chicago like it in is, nature but in chicago is the advertising capital right so because all the i remember when i first time i went to chicago it was a business trip and we went to the headquarters of advertising age mm -hmm. and and i realized that uh, chicago is, is the capital of advertising i mean everybody thinks it's the madison avenue in new york city that's where all the agencies are but the yeah, advertising is a as an activity in mm -hmm. terms of industry, it's based in Chicago and a lot of things are run from there. So uh, I guess that was, that is in the DNA of the city. And since you grew up in the city, it was uh, automatically, it's become part of you, it sounds like. 
Yep. Yeah, definitely. And, and even in New York, you know, you get on the subway, there's, there's, you know, ads above you, there's ads like billboards yeah. on the wall. I mean, it's just everywhere. So I think just being in that city environment, uh, you know, you're, you're surrounded by it. And most people probably hate it, but I, I found it really fascinating. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that, that, that kind of got things started. Yeah. Did your parents encourage you to pursue that interest? Or yeah, they definitely. didn't take notice, or because this is definitely something that formed your your whole way of thinking. Yeah, no, they they were extremely encouraging. Uh, you know, what whatever major in college I was interested in, they fully supported it. Whatever, uh, like for the independent study, they were all all in favor of doing that, uh, which is pretty unique as a high schooler to be able to do something, uh, you know, independent like that. Uh, and, and so, yeah, they, they were 100%, uh, you know, in favor of it. And even today, you know, they'll still send me, you know, ads that they see, pictures of ads, uh, you know, anything that they find r really interesting. So, and then they they also, you know, encourage me to travel. And, you know, I, I've been able to do quite a bit of that and kind of see you know, ad, ads around the world. That's been really cool, too. Do you have brothers, sisters? Yep. Yeah, I have a sister. And and does she feel the same way as you about advertising or not? Uh, she's big on TikTok and <laughs> and all that right now. I, she, I I don't know about her following, but but she's she gets really into all that. Uh, she's always got the latest technology, so she's more of a tech person, I think, than uh, than strictly ads. Uh, okay. But uh, but yeah. So the interest in advertising was was you then. It's not it's not her, but you were the one. Yeah, well, and my my dad uh, does B two B marketing, so uh, you know he, he's definitely in the the marketing space, uh, but on the B two B side. So uh, you know he would always tell me about his projects. I, I always thought they were super interesting, but I always found like the the b2c side even more interesting so uh wow. so that you know he, he encouraged me to learn a lot about all, all types of marketing uh and i've done done some b2b marketing in the past uh but uh so th there's been there's like a a hint of of uh you know advertising in the in the family uh but yeah. more on the b2b side so do you think that uh because you could have easily followed in your father's footsteps in terms of B2B approach. So you, you went the other way. Was that because you wanted to make your own space in the world with your authority? Uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I know like with B2B, there's a lot of consumer behavior there too. Uh, and, and, you know, understanding how business owners and, and business, uh, uh, business people think and why they purchase what they purchase but there's something about a consumer that it's it's like that on steroids so <laughs> uh, and like you know the media and everything it, it's it's very consumer focused uh, and yeah. so uh so you know I, i've been really into that uh just understanding you know how why do people think and uh you know I, with a business I would hope most people have their businesses' uh, interests in you know in mind, like financial interests. But a lot of the time, not always the case with consumers. I, I hope they have their financial interests, <laughs> you know, that, that they're thinking about it. But a lot of the time, uh, you know, with with business, people will do what's easy for them or what's convenient. Uh, and and that's super interesting, but with consumers, it's like this is their hard-earned money. And how are they going to spend it, right? And and how can I influence how they do that? Maybe that's evil of me to think about, uh, or, or maybe I'm evil for uh, you know perfecting the craft of of uh, persuading people to do uh, well, things that maybe aren't the smartest financial decision. But it's uh, I just know, but it's super of... interesting. Yeah. yeah. Shopping is a form of therapy, especially for women. But for business, shopping is the opposite. <laughs> it yeah, puts it, you it, in therapy because if you spend too much money, <laughs> you're running a loss, right? 
Yep. Yeah. But, but I also see, you know, you go to the airport, who's buying all the $5 waters and you know, yeah. it's business. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's small expenses that don't, you know, make a big difference, but to the company or they at least don't think it does, but you know, it, it's nice to have your thirsty move on. Right. <laughs> uh, whereas, you know, you see, uh, you know, consumer, maybe not so much. <laughs> This was great, John. You shared a lot of tips and clearly they are the best practices. So uh, I'm sure everybody listening will see great value. So tell us how can people reach out and connect with you? Give us your contact information. Yep. Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, my handle or username or whatever there is, is just my name. So uh, happy to go there. You can also search my name.com. Go. Uh, it takes you to my LinkedIn too. LinkedIn's normally the the go-to place for me uh yeah. so yeah happy to happy to reach out and, and chat with anyone about advertising amazon strategy any of that you know. great, and if you're great. interested in selling your business we we are buying businesses so uh so I, I can put you in the you know the uh connect you with the right people to have that discussion too great great we'll uh, we'll put all your contact information on with your episode so anybody uh, when they're downloading or watching on YouTube, they can see your contact information and reach out. So um, this was great, John. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Nick. Really appreciate it. And this brings us to the end of another episode, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Be sure and subscribe, rate, and review our show. And be sure and share an episode with a friend. And thank you so much for being with us today. We'll see you next week here on Amazon Legends.